My friends, we're about to enter the season of Lent and it's time for a different pace of life. So I'm sorry to say that uh, this episode is the penultimate episode of Covid Island Discs and next week will be the final one. I hope you've enjoyed joining my castaways on Covid Island and hearing their music and hearing a bit about them too. You can still watch all of the episodes on our YouTube channel so tune in anytime you like. Next week we have got a very special guest, the Bishop of Derby, Libby Lane, will be joining me here on Covid Island Discs, so do make sure you tune in then. In the meantime, enjoy today's episode. My castaway this week is a clergy colleague who has washed in from the eastern fringes of the North East Derbyshire Deanery. She was born in Rochford in Essex and grew up in Southend-on-Sea. She went to university in Leeds in 1996 to study classics. After her degree, she did a gap year with IFES in Tallinn, Estonia. She did various jobs in heritage and education before becoming a social media consultant in 2011 and then, in 2012, went to train for the ministry at Cranmer Hall in Durham. She is a massive telly addict and even wrote a book called More TV Vicar in 2015 about the portrayal of Christians on TV in the UK. Generosity is important to her, calling it her sacred value. She says, we have a really generous God. I think we should reflect that in everything we do, with our time, our money, our energy and ideas. Brian e. Taylor, welcome to Covid Island Discs. Thank you. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for being generous with your time and uh, coming on. <laughs> no, it's a great pleasure. So, um, Bryony, uh, first thing to say is I, I, my wife is uh, from South End on Sea. Really? Yes, oh, wow. and she was born in the same hospital. Oh gosh, yes. Yes, it's not. I, I don't think it's a maternity hospital anymore, but it was back in the day. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. wow. So there you it's go. The world. Indeed. Um, so you're the rector of um, St. James the Greater Barbara and St. John the Baptist Clown. How, how right. did you end up there? Yeah, well, um, I did my curacy um, up in the northeast in a place called Houghton Lispring, which is between Sunderland and Durham. And as I was coming towards the end of my curacy, my husband got a job in Sheffield and it was a dream job for him. He's a palliative care consultant um, and it's, he works at St Luke's Hospice in Sheffield now. Um, and this dream job came up there um, and we were like, this is definitely um, the right thing. Um, and so he moved down to, to Sheffield and then unfortunately it took nine months from him moving to Sheffield and me getting this job. Right. Um, so we had nine months apart, which wasn't much fun, but we managed to get through it. Um, mm. We tra traveled up, the, up and down the A1 every weekend to see each other. <laughs> um, and then this job came up uh, here in Bulber and Clown and the location was ideal. Um, it's just half an hour commute for him to get to work, but it's not directly in the catchment area of the hospice. So at least he's not bumping into patients too much and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So that's how I came to be here and it's it's a lovely part of the world out there i obviously traveled between those two places so uh, sort of halfway between where i was before and where i am now mm -hmm. and uh, it's got a great swimming pool uh and yes. it's got a costa coffee in the parish it has and like mcdonald's and a kfc which is a little bit lethal <laughs> <laughs> and dobby's yes and dobby's as well yeah we're a bit spoiled really we've got yeah. we've got everything you, you could want really yeah <laughs> No, it's great. And um, they're lovely little communities, aren't they? Mm, mm, very yeah. much so. Yeah. So we'll talk more about church and, and your sort of journey in faith. But tell us about your first piece of music, Bryony. Well, I found it really difficult to choose because this is my one secular piece of music and music's one of my passions, really. And I've got really what I would call Catholic uh, taste in music, which is like it's really broad. Um, yeah. And I, I just listen to music all the time and I've, I, I collect vinyl and really into it. So to choose just one secular track was really, really difficult. Um, but I decided to pick um, a song called Wake Up by Arcade Fire. Um, which is a really kind of uplifting piece of music. And I just find that 
sometimes we just I find music really helpful to kind of lift spirits mm. and just the lyrics it's kind of about love um it, one of the lines is I guess we'll just have to adjust and I um that's what we've had to do really yeah. in the last sort of 12 months so it that's why I picked that one it's one of my favorite songs so I just thought what, what will I pick for this one and uh it, my it, my brain landed on that one because it's uplifting but it's also kind of reflective a little bit of what's happened to us in the last year anthemic kind of bits in it hasn't it yeah definitely you just want to sort of join in really and cheer along get yeah. the lighters out and yeah it's, it's really uplifting <laughs> yeah excellent so uh, Bryony how did you sort of become a Christian were you raised in the faith did, did it come later in life what's the story uh, yeah, I was I was brought up in in a Christian family Um grew up uh, going to All Saints Church in Southend um, right. which was a quite an Anglo-Catholic sort of church, Bells and Smells. Mm -hmm. um, but I was quite lucky in that when I was 11, um, the bishop decided to appoint a new priest to our church that was going to kind of radically change things, really. And he was appointed to encourage the youth in the church. And so unusually, um, in a really it was a very formal Anglo-Catholic church. We suddenly, when I was at age 11, got mm. this priest called David Eller, who was quite evangelical and mm. he loved electric guitars. Um, mm. And, and he came to be our vicar. And, and what was brilliant about him was that he, he, he was quite happy to learn how to do all of the bells and smells stuff yeah. um, alongside being evangelical. And I think it had a really big, big influence on me as, as a kid, actually. Um, mm. And it was probably through him that I became a Christian. I was confirmed at quite a young age. I was confirmed at 12. Mm. Um, and, and also he used to take us on kind of, um, we used to do a lot of water sports with him. Uh, mm. That was his sort of passion. And he, he used to lead um, a Pathfinder camp, a youth camp uh, down in Cornwall every summer. Mm. Um, so I started to go to that when I was a teenager and then became a leader on that camp. Um, right. And really that kind of kept me in the faith really. Um, and then when I went to university, um, I, I got really involved in the Christian union Mm -hmm. And really, by the time I went to university, uh, when I was in sixth form, I was about the only one that had stayed in church out of my friendship group. Mm -hmm. um, everybody else had sort of stopped coming, really. Mm. Um, but I'd stayed. And and when I went to university, I was so thrilled to be around people my age because my mm. congregation that I was attending at home 
was full of people my parents age or older mm. um and so that was quite thrilling really at university and I got really involved in the Christian Union and became president of the Christian Union right. um in my second year at uni um and then and then um I did a gap year with um with the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, IFES. Oh, that's what it stands for, right? Yeah, okay. which is the basically the Christian Union movement in Europe, in Europe okay. or internationally, sorry. Um, so I, I basically went to work with the Christian Union in, in Tallinn, in Estonia, for wow. a year as a gap year. So that was quite... But that was an wacky, amazing really. experience. So, so yeah, um, faith journey has been quite sort of mixed and I've kind of moved from kind of Catholic, very Catholic settings to very evangelical settings, charismatic settings. My mm. friend says that I'm amphibious. <laughs> 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 that I can kind of, I can, I can relate um, to all, all different kinds of worship really. Um, but yes, I've, I've always had a faith right from being a small child. Yeah. Wow. And then ordination was that, you know, how did that come about? Was that a long yeah. journey? Um, it came quite late for me eventually in the end. Um, after university, I felt quite a strong pull towards ministry. Hmm. Um, but I kind of thought I'm only 21. I haven't experienced anything of life. And I really hadn't. I was very naive, really. Hmm. Um, and I just thought I'm not old enough to kind of cope with the pressures of being a minister. I don't know enough about the world. Yeah. And so I kind of made a bit of a deal with God. And I just sort of said, if this is something you want me to do, will you just nudge me when the time's right? Yeah. And then it was about, it was, was literally about 15 years later that the nudge came. Yeah. So I really put it on a back burner and did other things um, mm. and ended up working in museum education. And, um, you know, I had a really good time, a really good career doing, doing other things. Yeah. Um, and then I must have been about trying to think how old I was, but about 35 or something like that. Um, mm. When I kind of thought, actually, I think, I think God's calling me into ministry. Yeah. Um, and when I was going through that process, I reflected back over my, they always encourage you to think mm. back over your, your faith journey. Yeah. Um, when you, when you sort of apply to become, become a priest. Yeah. And I realized that when I was 10 years old, I used to, I used to fantasize about running my own church. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I used to have this kind of, I used to have these sort of imaginative play. I didn't kind of act it out, but I just yeah. did it in my head. Yeah. And I realised when I reflected back that that was quite weird, <laughs> and particularly because women couldn't be priests um, no, when I course. was that age. Yeah, there were no women priests. Um, and then actually, when I was sixteen, um, I did a project in school in RE about the ordination of women, and I interviewed Sheila, who was who had been a deaconess in our parish. Right. She was one of the first women to be ordained priest. And I interviewed her and um, my mum says that when the vote went through uh, Synod, that I'd said, oh, mum, that's another job opportunity for me. Oh, wow. but I don't remember saying it, but apparently <laughs> I did. So I think I think that sense of call was there from quite a young age. But but reflecting back, I'm really glad that I did other things mm. because I, th I think that was the right thing for me anyway, to get some experience of the world before before yeah. becoming a priest really and yeah. and what's been really interesting is that the last job I did before I was ordained was working as a social media consultant mm. and really the last sort of five years or so I've not done very much in that field um but then the pandemic happened yeah. <laughs> and the two parts of my life kind of converged yeah. and I suddenly realized that I had some skills I could use from my previous job yeah. And it really reminded me of something a Baptist minister said to me years ago, which is that nothing is wasted in God's economy. Mm. And it's amazing how God will use all your life's experiences at some point, um, either to yeah. bless others or to help you get through something, you know, um, nothing's yeah. ever wasted. Yeah. Even, even things that at the time feel disappointing can end yeah. up becoming really helpful in the future. Very true, very true. So tell us, uh, Bryony, about your second disc. Yeah, so a piece of music that was important at an earlier time when I came to Faith. Mm. Um, Delirious were a, a band in the 90s, a Christian band. They started off as a worship band at a church down in, um, near, um, oh, um, I'm trying to think, near Hastings, that direction. Okay. And, um, 
and they became quite big and they did end up getting into the charts and things. And we were very excited about them when I was at university. We thought that they were going to convert the country through their music, <laughs> <laughs> slightly naively. Um, but they were really good. I mean, they kind of quite inspired by U2, really. And they, mm. they did some really good music. And I went to see them live loads of times. And um, so they were that combination of quite a good rock band and really nice worship music. So mm. a lot of the songs that they did, we also sang in church yeah. and then later in later years they kind of did more like studio albums rather than worship albums mm. um but i could sing of your love forever is one of my sort of favorites from that period of my life and whenever i listen to delirious it just takes me back to university days and that kind of enthusiasm of being a young yeah. christian really yeah. <laughs> forever. Over the mountains and the sea Your river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart And let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing of when your love came down Yeah, I can sing of your love forever I can sing of your love When the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now, yeah. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love Yeah, it just takes me right back. It's it's amazing, isn't it, how music can kind of take you back to a place in time. You yeah. know, a bit like smells do as well. Sometimes you smell something and it kind of just takes you to a place. And I love the way music can do that. You yeah, can go you're, on a journey. you're dead right. Yeah. yeah. No, it's great. And we, we've needed that this year more than ever, haven't we? Because it's been so tough this yeah. last year. Mm. Uh, have you coped? I think I've been okay. Um, I think at the very beginning, the first lockdown, I found quite energising in a weird way mm. um, because we had to go, oh, right, we, we need to do church online and how we're going to make that work. And yeah. I kind of knew a little bit about that. Um, back in 2011, I did an online nine lessons and carol service back in 2011, which is wow. a long time ago. <laughs> so I, I got experience of doing this sort of stuff. So I was kind of excited at the beginning, really. Um, mm. And there was quite a lot of energy around, I think, and um, helping people to learn how to do stuff. And I got involved with, I made some videos to support other clergy and things. So I was kind of in quite a good place at the beginning. Mm. Um, but I think I think later on, I, it started to take its toll, really. The novelty wore off. Yeah. Um, and I've certainly, I think this third lockdown, like this year, has mm. been the worst, been the hardest. Yeah. Um, because I think one of the main things, actually, is when it first started, the whole world was doing it at the same time. <laughs> yes. um, whereas now each country is approaching it in different ways. So my best friend lives in France and in mm. France, they just have an evening curfew at the moment. And that's the only restriction really. Um, right. I think restaurants are closed as well, but you can get takeaways, but mm. essentially their lives haven't, you know, they're not under such a strong lockdown as we are. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've sort of lost that. We're in, we're all in it together feel. Yeah. Um, and there seems to be a bit of a, just don't really quite know when it's all going to be over. And I think yeah. I've, found that quite difficult so I've, I've been up and down like we all have mm. um 
And I think it's the first time I've experienced sort of depression that's been caused by external events. Mm. I think I found it quite hard with sort of Brexit and Trump and all of that on top mm. of this. It's been quite yeah. hard. So I think one of the things I've tried to do is is ration the news a bit because I'm a bit of a I, I like I like reading up on current affairs. I like knowing what's going on. But yeah. I started to realise that actually if I just consumed news all day, I was going to be really fed up. Yeah. So I've tried to ration it. So I only listen to sort of half an hour in the morning and that's it. And then yeah. get on with my day. So, uh, yeah, I've been up and down like we all have, really. It's not, it's not been easy. Yeah. Um, but I think there's been some glimmers of, of light and hope. Yeah. Sprinkled. And has music, music been a, a tonic for you during the time? Definitely, definitely, because it's kind of my go-to anyway in normal mm. circumstances. But yeah, particularly in the last year, I've listened to a lot of music, and I've I've kind of quite a lot of it actually. It's been quite nostalgic, you know, talking about mm. listening to music that takes you to a place. I think I think a lot of us have done that. Yeah. So I've been listening to Absolute Radio '90s quite a lot, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of comfort sort of feeling isn't it of, of yeah. going back to a place that you feel safe i think music can do that for you yeah so what's your third piece of music Bryony? this is a piece of music that i only discovered two weeks ago okay um there's a podcast on bbc sounds um that the that radio three do which introduces classical music to people that don't really know very much about classical music and what they do is it's a bit like a reverse desert island discs okay in that they get a celebrity and and this is an expert in classical music and they will they will give them six tracks to listen to right um and i was listening to one with Laura, the musician laura marling and this song was chosen as one mm. of the recommendations for her and i was just blown away by it um mm. just thought it was really beautiful um modern choral classical music um and it's called into thy hands um by a guy called Jonathan Dove, I think his name is. As I say, I've literally just discovered this piece of music. (laughs) Uh, But it's based on a prayer by St Edmund of Abingdon and the words are so sort of relevant for now. So it's the first line is, Into thy hands, O Lord and Father, we commend our souls and our bodies, our parents and our homes, friends and kindred. Into thy hands, O Lord and Father, we commend our benefactors and brethren departed. So... Mm. It's really just a heartfelt prayer and just feels like the kind of prayers that we've all been praying through this pandemic, really. Yeah. Um, so I just found it really powerful.
it, being in the church at this time is, is very difficult because we're all separated. But can you tell us about a time where you felt absolutely fantastic being part of the church? Yeah, I mean, I think of a few examples, but I think probably one of the main ones is visiting the Taizé community in France. Okay. Um, most people probably are familiar with the Taizé music, uh, the chants, uh, the most famous ones probably are Lord, Hear My Prayer. Um, we use them quite a lot in prayers in some mm. of our churches. Um, and it's a it's the most amazing place. Um, it's in in France, sort of central France, really. Um, and usually you go with a group of young people. Um, I got to go in 2006 and I was in my 20s then. And um, I actually count. I, I wasn't sort of going to sort of lead a youth group or anything. I was just sort of tagging along, mm. um, which actually meant it was great because it was recognised that I was a working person, and so I didn't have to do any chores or anything. So <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you're a teenager and you go, you get put into a group, a small group, um, and you're given various chores to do. But the chores for those of us who were working adults, um, our job was to hold up signs in the church. Um, saying silence and basically stopping kids kind of snogging in the back and stuff <laughs> <laughs> during the services. But basically they have a pattern of prayer of three, three prayer services a day in the church. Um, and there's about 150 monks that live there um, all the time. Wow. And the most amazing thing about it is that when you, when you arrive, you are put into a group um, and they do not allow any group to be monocultural there has to be more than one language spoken in your group. And quite right. often there's like five or six languages spoken in a group. And they just make sure that each group has got enough interpreters so that you can all communicate with one another. Yeah. Um, it's quite embarrassing if you're English and you turn up because they ask you what languages you speak. And most people say, oh, English and maybe a little bit of French. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. you've got these sort of Polish people who say, oh, yeah, I can speak Russian and a bit of German and a bit of English and a bit of French. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and they can all speak loads of languages. Um, but it's it's just really good to be reminded that God's not English. <laughs> and that's what I learned when I did my gap year in Estonia. You realise that actually... God is universal and is not an Englishman and the Bible wasn't written in English. And mm. I think actually that's quite an important thing to kind of understand mm. um, about Christianity and just being spending time with people from all around the world who all love Jesus is, is one of the best things you can do. And I think mm. as for a young person, it's one of the most sort of eye opening experiences you can have mm. is to just meet people from other cultures and realize that they also have a passion for Jesus. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of one of my sort of, go to memories really thinking about yeah. where church feels really really like like church like heaven really yeah yeah all, yeah. all the tribes being there um Absolutely. there's just something really beautiful about that place and and singing the chants all together and, and when you're there uh, in this country when we sort of do Teze services we tend to either sing in latin or mm. in english and we don't really pick, sing any of the other language songs but mm. when you're at Teze you sing in Polish and Czech and Russian mm. and Italian and Spanish and French and Latin and English Estonian you sing in loads mm. of different languages and there's something really powerful about that I think mm. so your next piece of music is is from Teze isn't it I think it is yeah I've chosen this one it's called Nada Tatorbe and it's in Spanish and mm. it's taken from Teresa of Avila's prayer let nothing disturb you let nothing frighten you um and God alone will suffice for your all your needs it's a beautiful prayer um and yeah this one in particular is sung in Spanish Nada.
It's interesting you should uh, say that about the different languages uh, for doing these Taze chants because I've been trying to encourage people here to have a go at using the um, the app Pray As You Go. Um, and often oh, they feature, that. it's good, isn't it? And yeah. often they feature um, Taze stuff, which is done in French or German. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this, this is good. Yeah, it's just good to be exposed to things from elsewhere, I think. Yeah. And realise that actually music and worship is more than just understanding the words there's mm. there's something else to it as well i think yeah and just letting yourself be taken up with it and i think it's kind of connected to that talk in acts about speaking in tongues and mm. you know we tend to think about speaking in tongues as being kind of mm. angelic languages but it, but it's mm. also about different languages yeah you know um being yeah. used to praise god yeah that's really good so uh, would you believe we're getting towards the end um was one more piece of music to hear which we'll come to shortly but what ha survival tips have you got for us on covid island uh, we've hopefully got not too much longer to go but how can we get through it well i've been reminding myself of the tips i gave myself at the beginning of the first lockdown which was ration the news yeah. don't gorge on it um Give yourself some treats, uh, maybe book something in the diary. Something that me and my husband have been doing is we've been getting these um, recipe boxes for cooking meals. Mm. And that's been really good because it's felt like a treat, but it's also meant that we've not needed to go to the supermarket. So that's been good. Mm. And they deliver all the ingredients that you need for that particular dish. Mm. And it's just made us cook proper food um so sort of maybe maybe just find one or two things that are going to be a treat and something that you can look forward to so you can put it in the diary so it might just be oh i'm gonna have a zoom call with my mum um mm. on friday or my friends from school or whatever mm. um so i think it's kind of putting it's kind of getting some kind of routine i think yeah. um because the days just sort of blur into one don't they at the moment <laughs> um so yeah so i think being kind to yourself as well and not putting yourself under too much pressure because it's quite it is exhausting this whole experience and it's okay to have a day where you just don't really do very much and don't achieve very much because yeah. all of us are i think it's been an opportunity for some of us to actually slow down i mean i'm, I'm a kind of I, I i am on the go usually all the time mm. And it's forced me to slow down. Uh, um, but I think, of course, the most obvious tip is to set aside time each day to pray mm. um, as much as she can. Even if uh, I know Bishop Libby, she's got she's got an alarm on her phone that bleeps at 12 o'clock each day and she stops and says the Lord's Prayer. I mean, something as simple as that mm. um, can just keep you on, on, on the on the straight and narrow, so to speak. Yeah. 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 No, that's really good advice. Thank you, Bryony. So your final piece of music, please tell us about it. We just had this actually. Um, we sang it quite a bit in our, well, in our online services in the run up to Christmas. It's quite often sung at Advent, mm. but I chose it for our Candlemas uh, service that we just had this last Sunday. Mm. And it's called Christ Be Our Light. And I think out of all the kind of hymns, we sing quite a lot of traditional hymns in my churches. Um, but out of all the hymns that we sing, this one's just really been a bit of an anthem for the pandemic year for me mm -hmm. um because it's because what i like about this hymn is that the lyrics kind of acknowledge that the world is quite a dark place and there are mm -hmm. problems mm -hmm. and that christ's light shines in that darkness mm -hmm. and so i found it quite a moving moving hymn to kind of listen to and to sing along with uh, mm -hmm. at home um so that's why i've picked it really it's i think it's that idea of christ's light shining in this darkness and and a lot of us have been lighting candles regularly and things like that to pray mm. um so that's why i've picked it
that's one of my favorites that is it's a good one yeah it's sort of becoming a bit of a regular one isn't it of sort of favorite a bit like shine jesus shine was a few years yeah. ago <laughs> it's sort of becoming the new version of that although i think it's better than shine jesus shine actually i like it more um yeah i agree i agree i mean i've <laughs> We're going to come on. Well, you're going to get to take with you the complete works of Graham Kendrick. Uh, what, what do you think <laughs> of of him? Are you <laughs> are you a fan? I am actually. You know, people knock him, but actually, you know, what a great songwriter! What a great songwriter he is! And and mm. you know, I find now actually a lot of wedding couples choose "Shine Jesus Shine" because they remember it from school. You know, yeah. school kids absolutely love it. They love it. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I did a I did a wedding in lockdown um, in October. We could only have fifteen people, a lovely couple in my church, and they're regular churchgoers as well. So it yeah. was it was going to, it should have been a big big church wedding, mm. you know. And they picked Shine Jesus Shine because they're quite young, um, yeah. and and they in the end the organist played it because of course we weren't allowed to sing the yeah. organist played it um, and we did we just did all the actions <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually really joyful and really lovely so yeah I'm quite a fan of Graham Kendrick and I saw him he played at Greenbelt um the Greenbelt Festival on the 40th anniversary and yeah. he was fab he was great he did the most amazing set and actually singing Shine Jesus Shine with like thousands of people in a field was it's really yeah. good. It was really good. So I, I think he's good. People, people knock him, and I don't like all of his <laughs> all of his hymns, but um, yeah. but actually, quite a lot of them. You know, I grew up with them, so yeah. You know, um, I'm quite well, a fan, really. You can have them on repeat on the island because you've got the <laughs> yeah. whole lot, um, and you've got the Bible as well. That's uh, good. <laughs> yeah, it is. You need that. <laughs> <laughs> and a book of your choice. What would you mm. take? Well, I'm not sure whether I'm allowed this. And I, if it were the proper Desert Island Discs, I wouldn't I wouldn't choose it. But I was wondering if I could have <laughs> the whole set of Harry Potter books. Can I have all seven or can I only choose one? No, you, we're very your generosity. You've taught us all about generosity. So we are going to be generous. And you can oh, brilliant. Have all seven. So the whole set of Harry Potter books, I just find them there. Again, it's kind of that nostalgia and comfort reading, you know, going going into a world that's different from our own. Um, yeah. I just I find them really, really easy to read, good fun. And yeah, they're, they're easy to kind of pick up and where you left off sort of thing. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm quite a big Harry Potter fan. So <laughs> good. Well, you've got Harry Potter uh, to list, uh, to read uh, to your heart's content and also, and you can take a, another item with you. What would you take? I think I would take. A guitar. I'm, I'm not any good at all, really, at playing the guitar. I can play about three chords um, yeah. and sort of strum away. But I guess if I had some time on a desert island, hmm. that I I could I could improve and learn a bit more. Um, yeah. m- might need a little um, instruction book to go along with it. But but yeah, I think I'd take yeah. a guitar so that I could sing and worship God on hmm. my own and uh, and get better at playing. Yeah. You could play I Could Sing of Your Love Forever, couldn't you? I could. I could. If you've got all that time on the sing island. Sing it forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on loop. <Yeah. laughs> so of those five tracks, which one would you, if you ha- could only save one of them from the from the shark-invested island, which one would it be? I think I would pick the one that's newest to me, which is right. the Into Thy Hands piece, because hmm. I think there's depths of, in that that could be discovered, because I because as I say, I've literally only just discovered that piece of music. So I think um, I think unusually a lot of the other things I've chosen have all been based on nostalgia. Yeah. But that one is a new one to me. So I think um, I think I would save into thy hands and and kind mm. of let myself get immersed into that piece of music. Mm. Well, Brian, it's been a real pleasure just to get to know you a bit and hear some of your music and uh, hear some of your story. We, there's much more we could have spoken about, but thank you for joining me on COVID Island Discs and God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.